it's called the International AGN Alliance Discord server. And we're having, it's a lot of student um, oriented events. Um, for example, like coffee hours. Um, and I'm also organizing a, uh, a student symposium that's gonna take place at the end of the year. So if you have like any students that you wanna join, um, please send them the link um, here. I'm gonna, I'll, I'll put the link in the chat. Um, anyone, anyone can join professors, students. Um, I just want it to be a forum that people can bu build community and talk to each other um, throughout the AGN community all around the world. Um, so yeah, and, and we're going to have, um, I've, I've had a lot of um, postdocs and researchers show interest in giving talks to, to the undergraduates and graduate students in the, in the server. Um, about their research. Again, very, very um, not very, not super high level, but like very tailored to undergraduates and graduate students. Um, so maybe I'm, th I'm thinking that maybe that's gonna start also um, early, early next month, um, along with the student research symposium, which is gonna be a little, um, probably spaced out a little more. Um, I'm also planning, I'm gonna hold the first review talk um, just on some simple topics um, next week, I believe. Um, it was gonna happen this week, but uh, my, uh, my schedule got super hectic. Um, so yeah, so please join and, and if you have students. Um, oh, also after so after this talk, we're so, so the students in the chat are going to be getting in um, a voice channel to discuss the topics that were discussed in this um this this talk. And Mallory, if you have time, we'd love for you to join. Um, but of course, you know your schedule is a bit hectic. Um, we know everyone's everyone's busy. So um, so yeah, that's, that's that's just what's happening with that. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Thank you so much, Jeffrey. Yeah, and also we, we wanted to um, promote any DEI um, activities. Um, so if anyone has ideas on that, it would be really, really good to spread awareness and, and be, you know, have that be part of the uh, community building activities that we were doing. So I think we can get started. There was a lot of interest, Mallory, in your talk this week because people were emailing me saying, oh, I'm so excited to come to the talk. They're not here yet, but uh, we we will get started since um, it's it's uh, six minutes past twelve. So it is my pleasure to introduce uh, Mallory Molina today, uh, who is our our speaker for the International AGN Science Seminar Series. And uh, Mallory, uh, I met a number of years ago when she was a grad student at Penn State. And I'm, I'm really delighted to see how well she's doing now. She uh, got her PhD from Penn State, and then uh, she went on uh, to get a postdoc position at Montana State University, where she uh, is currently working. And recently, she got the very prestigious Ford Postdoctoral Fellowship, uh, which is a real honor. And so I congratulate Mallory for, for achieving that. And Mallory has a wide range of interests. She's been studying massive black holes and dwarf galaxies. Uh, most recently, she's uh, studied black hole feedback uh, and the interaction with the host galaxy, star formation, quenching, uh, dust attenuation in nearby galaxies. And uh, I remember when we had a conversation when we met, she was studying liner galaxies. So she has a really wide range of experience uh, studying AGNs. And uh, I should say that I was very impressed uh, to see all of the various fellowships and awards that she's won over the years uh, with HST time, SWIFT time. Um, she's got a lot of ground-based observing uh, experience and a lot of modeling experience because I remember we had a cloudy discussion when I was there. And, uh, and it's very nice to see someone who's so actively uh, observing as well as having a, a really nice theoretical foundation. And uh, I also wanted to mention all of the um, really nice um, uh, diversity and inclusion activities that she's been involved with. And I uh, encourage people to talk to her about it. Uh, it's, it's really impressive, uh, the science she's carrying out and at the same time, on doing these very important initiatives that I wanted to highlight in my introduction. So with that, I am very excited to, ha uh, to uh, have her talk to us about her papers on um, finding coronal lines in dwarf galaxies, which is of particular interest to me. So I'll hand it over to you, Mallory. Well, thanks for the really kind introduction. Um, like Shoda said, my name is Mallory Molina. Uh, I'm a Ford postdoctoral fellow at Montana State. And today I'm going to be discussing my work, identifying massive black holes and dwarf galaxies using the coronal line iron 10. 
So even though we talk about galaxies as being a single object, they're actually a collection of many different objects which reside in different parts of the galaxy. So outside of the galaxy center or the nucleus, you'll find stars, dust, and gas. And those are the dominant matter components of most galaxies. Meanwhile, a supermassive black hole resides in the center or the nucleus of almost all massive galaxies. And in fact, my previous work has involved studying these different galaxy components. Um, so I identified power sources of weakly accreting black holes and massive galaxies in my 2018 papers. And then I created a near UV and optical catalog, which I've used to study dust and starlight in nearby galaxies in my 2020 papers. However, today I'm gonna to be talking about my work finding massive black holes and dwarf galaxies. And this is really important for understanding how supermassive black holes have evolved over time. So as I said before, almost every massive galaxy has a central supermassive black hole, and that includes our own Milky Way. However, one of the really big unanswered questions in the field is how do these black holes actually form in the first place? So while we don't know for sure, there are a couple of different scenarios that are considered in the literature. The first is that the first generation of stars, which we call population three stars, collapsed and became black holes with masses of around 100 solar masses. Secondly, you could have runaway collisions in very dense star clusters, and those would result in black holes of around 100 to 10,000 solar masses. Finally, you could have direct uh, collapse of clouds of gas that would basically skip that stellar phase, and those would create black holes of around 100,000 solar masses in size. And so, in essence, these three processes that we just talked about would create the black hole seeds that would then grow over cosmic time to create the supermassive black holes that we see in the center of massive galaxies today. Unfortunately, we can't directly test which of these theories is true because detecting black hole seeds in the early universe isn't currently possible. So if we wanted to look for um, black hole seeds, we would want to look at the farthest distances away possible because the farther away you look from Earth, the farther back in time you're looking. However, we can really only detect integrated light from those high redshift or those early universe galaxies. And that's what this image here on the top right is trying to show you. So this is a Hubble Space Telescope view field image. And you can see in these cutout windows, there are these points of light with redshift values next to them. And these points of light are actually entire galaxies. And so they hold all of the stars and the dust and the gas that we previously talked about. So if we wanted to look for a black hole, in these galaxies, it would need to be so bright that it would outshine the host galaxy that it resided in for us to be able to detect it. And we call these kinds of black holes quasars and they are already massive. They can have masses of a billion solar masses or more. And therefore they're way too big and have evolved way too much for us to use them to constrain those much smaller 100 to 100,000 solar mass black hole seeds. So instead of trying to look in the high redshift or early universe, we instead rely on um, local dwarf galaxies. So if you look at this image on the right, you can see that I've circled three kind of splotchy looking galaxies. And these are actually dwarf galaxies that exist in our local universe. And you can tell just by looking at this chart that they're physically much smaller in size than a typical Milky Way-like galaxy that I have labeled here. And in fact, the upper mass limit for a dwarf galaxy is usually around um, a billion solar masses. Meanwhile, the Milky Way has a mass of about 10 billion solar masses. These dwarf galaxies are smaller because they really haven't interacted over cosmic time as their more massive counterparts. So if there is a black hole in these dwarf galaxies, it should have a mass similar to its initial seed mass. And in fact, these black holes fall in a different mass regime than the typical supermassive black holes in dwarf galaxies. And that's what this uh, image is showing. So for reference, a stellar mass black hole, which happens at the end of a massive star's life, will have masses in the order of tens of solar masses. On the opposite end of the spectrum, a supermassive black hole, which we find in massive galaxies, will have a mass of about a million solar masses or more. In the middle lies black holes that we find in dwarf galaxies in what's called the intermediate mass black hole regime. And the observed black holes in dwarf galaxies have estimated masses of around 100,000 solar masses. And so that means that they are 
bigger than these stellar mass black holes and therefore are likely a result of those initial black hole seeds, but they haven't evolved over time as much as those supermassive black holes. And so they're our best current option to constrain black hole seed properties. However, because these black holes are smaller, that means they're less bright or less luminous than the um, active black holes in massive galaxies. And so their signal can be easily hidden by host galaxy star formation. One way I like to think about this is by considering the single fiber um, Sloan Digital Sky Survey or SDSS spectroscopic survey. So what they did in this survey is they took a three arc second fiber and they pointed it at roughly the nucleus of each galaxy to get a spectrum of that object. Now in a massive galaxy, the three arc second fiber is pretty small compared to the size of the galaxy. So you can really zoom in on what's happening in the nucleus. However, that same three arc second fiber in a dwarf galaxy will take up a significant fraction of the entire galaxy itself. And so you're letting in relatively large amounts of that host galaxy starlight that is then competing with that less luminous black hole um, in the observed data. And so as a result, most searches will tend to only find the most luminous, high accretion rate, high mass black holes in dwarf galaxies, because those are the ones that can easily be seen over the host galaxy starlight. And as a result, the low mass black hole population in dwarf galaxies is left relatively unexplored. However, we really need to know the true population of all of the black holes in dwarf galaxies in order to best constrain those seeding mechanisms that we talked about. So I'm interested in trying to find new ways to look for um, black holes in dwarf galaxies. Now, some of the traditional ways that we look for um, black holes is also how we try to look for them in dwarf galaxies. And we use our knowledge of the AGN engine, which I'm showing here in the top left. So in the middle, you have that massive black hole. And then around it, you have that geometrically thin, optically thick accretion disk where matter is spiraling onto the black hole. Then outside of that structure, you'll have gas that's being photoionized by that accretion disk. It can either be close by and be moving fast and have broad line emission profiles or farther away and have narrower line profiles. Additionally, you have these conical lobes of radio emission that usually come out perpendicular to the accretion disk as well as a, a surrounding dusty torus. So some of the ways that we look for active black holes and dwarf galaxies are looking for optical emission, either those broad line profiles or narrow line ratios consistent with AGN activity, X-ray emission, which comes from upscattering from that accretion disk, infrared emission that's coming from the heat to dust in that torus, or um, radio emission coming from those jet outflows. However, looking for um, active black holes in dwarf galaxies is actually a relatively new field. And in fact, the first systematic optical search for black holes in dwarf galaxies was only completed by Ryan et al. in 2013. And they used a combination of uh, narrow line indicators as well as bright line indicators. So the narrow emission line ratios that they used are O3 over H beta versus N2 over H alpha, which I'm showing here in this diagram from their work. So um, you can use this to separate objects that appear AGN-like, star forming like or composite like, which could be a combination of both AGN and star formation activity. So using this diagram, they were able to identify about 40 AGN objects and about hundred more composite objects. They also looked for broad H alpha emission, which could indicate that really fast moving gas around the central black hole. And they were able to find some, including the uh, example that I'm showing here. So this work was really important because it demonstrated for the first time that there is indeed a population of black holes in dwarf galaxies that we can study. However, this uh, study is necessarily picking out the most luminous high accretion rate objects because they need to be bright enough to be stronger than the star formation in the SDSS spectra in order for them to be identified using this diagram. And so this leaves us with this nagging realization that we are missing, we are likely missing these less luminous black holes that are hidden by host galaxy star formation in BPT style diagrams. And so we're really interested in trying to find new ways to find those less luminous, harder to find black holes. 
And today I'm going to talk about one of the methods that I have been using um, to look for um, low accretion rate black holes in dwarf galaxies, and that relies on the corona line, iron 10 6374. Now this line is pretty special because it has a pretty high ionization potential of about 260 eV. And for reference, hydrogen only has an ionization potential of about 13.6 eV. Now this line can be created in one of two ways in um, dwarf galaxies or in um, active black holes. So um, the first way would be um, photoionization in the hot X-ray corona surrounding a high accretion rate black hole, hence the name corona line. However, it's also been shown to be able to be produced mechanically from outflowing winds. And that might be the more reasonable scenario in a low accretion rate black hole. So in what's called the radiatively inefficient um, accretion flow or advection dominated accretion flow, ADAF or RIAF engine, um, you'll have a geometrically thin, optically thick accretion disk until you hit this certain transition radius marked here, where then the accretion disk puffs up and then slowly accretes onto the black hole. And this engine is uh, known to have very strong mass loss via strong outflowing winds. And those outflowing winds are what could create the iron 10 emission. And I was actually motivated to look for iron 10 systematically in dwarf galaxies because I detected it in two previous case studies. So the first object I found it in was J1220-3020, and I'm showing an optical image of this galaxy here. Ryan's et al. 2020 detected a strong radio source consistent with an active black hole in that radio detection shown here. Then in my 2021 paper, I was able to not only confirm the presence of an active black hole in this object, but I found very strong iron 10 emission. So here's the L1 lines, and then there's that really strong iron 10 line. I found this line again in Markarian 709 South. And so this is a dwarf galaxy shown here. It's actually interacting with another galaxy, Markarian 709 North, shown here. Ryan's et al. 2014 first identified the low luminosity black hole in this object using radio and X-ray observations. And then in Kimber et al. 2021, we again found iron 10, and this time in the SDSS 3XX spectrum. So there's those O1 lines, and then there's that iron 10 line again. So this means that I was able to detect iron 10 in two different galaxies, both of which had their AGN missed by the BBT diagrams or traditional optical techniques. And so this led me to wonder, could I actually use iron 10 to help us find those low luminosity AGNs that are hidden by star formation in BBT diagrams? And so to answer that question, I led the first systematic search for iron 10 in dwarf galaxies. And this work is published on archive um, and it's my uh, second 2021 paper. So um, I'm gonna give you a brief rundown of what I did and then we'll talk about the details. So I started with a parent sample of about 46,000 galaxies in the most recent NASA Sloan Atlas catalog. Out of those, I found 81 objects that had iron 10 emission that was um, detectable. And given their luminosities, all of them are considered black hole candidates. About 50% of those objects showed additional signatures of AGN activity. So signatures not including iron 10. Finally, I found that these iron 10 selected black hole candidates were uh, in lower mass bluer galaxies than those identified via traditional optical techniques. So now that I've told you kind of the punchline, let's talk about the details. So in order to find iron 10 selected galaxies, I first had to fit iron 10. So the first thing I did um, was I created a three-step fitting process. I started by fitting the L1-6300 line, um, which you're seeing here. And then I used that model to perfectly fit and subtract the L1-6363 line. Now we purposely did not freely fit 6363 as it could be blended with iron 10 6374 because they're so close. So after I subtracted it, I then fit the residual spectrum um, for an iron 10 line, which I'm showing in this diagram here. So after running um, through all the objects, I found 81 candidates that had uh, strong iron detections with at least a signal to noise of two in the integrated flux, as well as requiring a um, peak higher than twice the noise in the spectrum. 
And so if we look at the host galaxies of these iron 10 selective black hole candidates, um, you can see just by looking at the images that they're quite varied. So um, there's a lot of different sizes, a lot of different morphologies, a lot of different inclination angles, et cetera. But one of the things that you can see is somewhat common um, out of all of these host galaxies is their color. They do tend to look pretty blue. Um, and that indicates a lot of active ongoing star formation in the host galaxy. And so keep that in mind because that is a point that I'm going to return to later in the talk. So after I identified my iron 10 selected black hole candidates, I then wanted to search for additional evidence of AGN activity. Now I do note that I consider iron 10 an AGN detection technique. And as I mentioned before, star formation can hide AGN activity in other um, different detection methods. However, I still used a slew of optical diagnostics that I've listed here, as well as looking for um, radio and X-ray emission and cross-matching with previous studies. However, for today's talk, I'm gonna be focusing on the four that I have outlined here, namely the BPT style narrow line diagnostic diagrams, broad H alpha, and then radio and X-ray emission. And if you're interested about any of the other techniques, I do have slides and I can talk about them after the talk. So I first started by looking at the BPT style diagrams and those are O3 over H beta versus N2, S2 and O1 over H alpha. And so you'll see clearly that there's one object that's AGN in all three diagrams. And then one object that is composite like in the N2 over H alpha and Seifert-like in the other two diagrams. And these are actually overlaps between my sample and that of Ryan's et al. 2013. However, the rest of the objects appear to be um, star forming in the N2 over H alpha diagram. One interesting thing to note is that the O1 over H alpha diagram shows a significant amount of objects that are in the Seifert regime. Now, because O1 is, um, not as strongly produced by host galaxy star formation compared to um, nitrogen and sulfur too, this line could be uh, the least eluded by host galaxy star formation and could be giving us the strongest indication of AGN candidates using this technique. Um, regardless, about 30% of my sample appeared non-star forming in at least one of the three diagrams shown here. I then considered broad H alpha. And I found two objects that had strong broad H alpha, and both of which were actually found um, in that Ryan's et al. 2013 paper originally. So the first is NSA 256802. And so you can see there's very strong broad H alpha emission right here. And this object was actually the one that was AGN like in all three BPT diagrams. So not super surprising. Um, on the other hand, NSA 427201 has pretty weak broad H alpha emission, as you see here, and it was star forming in all three BBT diagrams. And I'll be talking about both of these objects later in the talk. Finally, I consider, or sorry, then I consider radio emission. Um, I use the first radio survey to look for uh, radio emission in my objects. And out of the 81, five of them were detected and four of them, the ones on this top row here, had radio emission consistent with AGN activity. However, I will note that the first radio survey may not be sensitive enough to detect radio emission um, in AGN and dwarf galaxies. And so more dedicated follow-up could result in more objects that are uh, radio selected AGNs. Finally, I looked at X-ray emission and to do this, I looked at archival Chandra data. So out of the 81 objects that I had, six of them had been observed. And then I compared their Chandra X-ray luminosity to the global star formation rate as a function of metallicity to that expected from X-ray binaries to find two X-ray detected AGMs. So the data are here in black. And then these blue bars represent the expected emission from X-ray binaries. And so you can see only this object, NSA 275961, and this one, 256802, are the two that are X-ray detected using this technique. However, only six objects out of the 81 have been observed. So if we have more X-ray observations, this might result in more X-ray detected AGMs. 
So to kind of summarize the results that I've talked about so far, um, I went to look for iron town emission in dwarf galaxies, and I found 81 of them that had strong iron town emission that could indicate um, an act, the presence of an active black hole. Furthermore, about 50% of those objects showed additional signatures of AGN activity in at least one of the different um, AGN detection techniques I was talking about before. However, one really important fact is that a majority of these iron 10 emitting galaxies are vigorously forming stars. And you can see that by looking at the star formation rate versus stellar mass diagram that I have here on the bottom left. So this blue solid line and dashed lines are the star forming main sequence and one sigma uncertainties for dwarf galaxies from a Goddard 2017. So if an object falls within this region, you can consider it actively forming stars. And if it falls above that region, you could consider it starburst-like. And so that means it is forming stars at an extreme rate given its stellar mass. So given the fact that a lot of these galaxies are either actively or vigorously forming stars, the next important question is, could stellar processes actually be powering the observed iron 10 emission that we're seeing and essentially creating false positive AGN detections in our sample? So while coronal lines can be produced by stellar me stellar processes in a variety of ways, the only two that really can create strong iron 10 emission in galaxies are novae and supernovae. And I'm gonna talk about each of them individually. So I started by looking at novae, and that happens when a white dwarf is accreting material from its companion star, which results in a runaway reaction and an explosion of material. So while iron 10 has been detected in novae, um, extragalactic novae or novae outside of our Milky Way, we would need around 1,000 to 10,000 novae to explain the minimum luminosity around 10 to 36 arcs per second in our iron 10 emitting dwarf galaxy sample. And so given known novae rates, this is really not a reasonable um, explanation for the iron 10 emission in dwarf galaxies. So I then considered supernovae. Now the type of supernova that can create the strongest coronal line emission most consistent with our AGN sample would be the type 2N supernovae. And this uh, supernova is pretty special because it's defined by its interaction with the circumstellar medium. And the most luminous uh, coronal line emission seen in a type uh, 2N supernovae was seen in type or uh, SN 2005 IP. And I'm showing day one and day 413 um, spectra from that uh, supernova here below. So some interesting things to note are the very characteristic broad um, three component H alpha profile, as, the, as well as the very rich and luminous coronal line forest. Now, type 2N supernovae are already pretty rare. They only make up about 9% of all type 2 supernovae's. And supernova 2005 IP is rare in itself as it has some of the strongest coronal line emission seen in um, type 2N supernovae, stronger than others actually. And so we used the maximum iron 10 luminosity in SN 2005 IP to define our maximum expected luminosity from a supernova. So when we compare that um, value, which is this line shown here, you can see that most of the galaxies in our sample would need anywhere from two to 160 type 2 and supernova to have exploded within 100 days of the SDSS observation in order to explain the observed iron 10 emission. However, at most, we'd only expect eight total type 2 and supernovae in our parent sample of 46,000 dwarf galaxies. And so this is not a viable explanation for a majority of the objects in our sample. And so we concluded that the iron 10 emission that we're seeing in these dwarf galaxies is really being driven by black hole activity. So now that we've kind of discussed um, the stellar processes and we've determined that it is indeed being driven by black hole activity, I then wanted to talk about how is this line being created? 
So you may remember from the beginning of my talk that I mentioned two different ways that iron 10 can be created in um, active black holes. The first is photoionization in that hot corona, which you might expect in a high accretion rate black hole. And the second is mechanically via outflows, um, which might be more common in a low accretion rate black hole. So since we know that a majority of our objects appear to be AGN driven, the natural question is which of these processes is creating the iron 10 emission that we're seeing? And the answer to that question is actually both. So we know of an example of both a high and low accretion rate object. So the high accretion rate object, NSA 256802, um, has very broad H alpha emission, is BPT like in all three, um, or sorry, AGN like in all three BPT diagrams, and has very strong X ray emission. So there's no reason to believe that it's not a high accretion rate AGN and that its iron 10 emission is being driven by photoionization. On the other hand, Mercarian 709 South was confirmed to be a low accretion rate AGN by Ryan et al. 2014, who looked at a combination of Chandra and VLA radio data. So this means that the iron 10 emitting dwarf galaxy sample has both high and low accretion rate black holes, but the exact ratio of these is unknown. However, I am interested in exploring this further using follow-up observations. Now, another way that black holes can create that iron 10 emission is through tidal disruption events or TDEs. And this is a transient event that happens when a star is tidally disrupted and then accreted by a black hole. And unlike an AGN, which is um, generally or roughly constant accretion, these TDEs are transient. And so its emission will fade on a time scale of a few years. Now there's a specific class of tidal disruption events called extreme coronal line emitters, which um, perhaps unoriginally are tidal disruption events with extremely strong coronal lines, and that includes iron 10. So some of the spectral properties of these extreme coronal line emitters include peak iron 10 luminosities of around 10 to 38 to 10 to 40 ergs per second, broad H alpha emission that will fade on time scales of eight years, and they tend to be located in the star forming region of the N2 over H alpha BPT diagram. And that's what this figure from Wong et al 2012 shows. So this is the O3 over H beta versus S2 over H alpha, N2 over H alpha, and O1 over H alpha. So these blue points are just normal AGNs that have coronal line emission. And then these red points are the extreme coronal line emitters. So you can see in the N2 over H alpha diagram, they tend to fall in the star forming and composite region. However, in the O1 over H alpha diagram, you'll notice that a lot of them appear secret-like or liner-like. So they fall outside of that star forming region of the diagram. And that's pretty similar to what we saw with the iron 10 select galaxies. And so I think it's fair to say that the extreme coronal line emitters and our iron 10 selected galaxies do seem to have uh, similar spectral properties. So they have similar iron 10 luminosities and they fall in similar regions in this, these BBT diagrams. And in fact, we have one object that is a pretty strong TDE candidate, and that's NSA 427201. Um, and this object has iron 10 strength similar to other TDEs. It also has this broad line emission seen in the SDSS spectrum that disappears about 11 years later with follow up, as shown by Baldessari et al. 2016. And it's star forming in all three BBT style diagrams. And so this is really exciting because it means that iron 10 could help us detect TDEs or tidal disruption events in dwarf galaxies. So now that I've kind of talked about how the iron 10 is being created by these black holes, I wanna switch gears and talk about the host galaxy properties of these iron 10 selected black hole candidates and specifically how they compare to those uh, you found using traditional optical techniques. And I'm doing that by looking at the color versus stellar mass diagram that I'm showing here. And so if you've never looked at one of these before, for reference, a redder galaxy with lower star formation rate would fall up here, and a bluer galaxy with higher star formation rates would fall down here. Now the uh, traditional AGN and composite objects are shown as these red squares and blue triangles respectively. Meanwhile, the iron 10 selected dwarf galaxies are shown by these black circles. 
So you can see just by looking that the iron 10 selected dwarf galaxies extend to a lower mass and trace the tail of the overall um, dwarf galaxy population shown by those gray circles a lot better than those traditionally optically selected black holes. And in fact, the iron 10 selection method seems to identify active black hole candidates in lower mass or bluer or more vigorously star forming galaxies. And this is really exciting because this means that iron 10 can help us cut through that host galaxy star formation that really prevents us from detecting um, black holes using traditional optical methods. And so as a result, this is showing that the iron 10 selection method is really complementary to those traditional searches as it can help you create a more diverse and representative black hole um, galaxy candidate set. And additionally, unlike X-ray and radio observations which require dedicated high resolution follow-up, this is easily applicable to the currently available optical data sets. Furthermore, because we're identifying black hole candidates in lower mass galaxies, it could help us identify lower mass black holes. And this is because black hole mass scales with galaxy stellar mass, as shown by this figure from Reins and Bull and Terry 2015. So here, black hole mass is on the y-axis and galaxy stellar mass is on the x-axis. And you can see that um, while the scatter is pretty large, the qualitative result that um, lower mass black holes are found in lower mass galaxies seems to hold even in the dwarf galaxy regime. So this means that if we can get independent mass measurements from these iron 10 selected black hole candidates, we could put strong constraints on the black hole mass galaxy stellar mass uh, relation at that crucial low mass end of the uh, scaling relation. And so as a result, iron 10 selected black holes can significantly increase our knowledge of the dwarf galaxy black hole population, especially at that very critical low mass end. So given these results, um, there are some kind of obvious next steps with the iron 10 selected sample. So the first would be to confirm the presence of active black holes in these galaxies. The second would be to look at what types of AGNs are we detecting? Are they more of the high accretion rate? Or are they more of the low accretion rate? And finally, how do these black holes affect the host galaxy? So for example, if it's a low accretion rate black hole, you could have a lot of outflowing winds. And is that um, stopping star formation in the host galaxy? And so these are really um, important questions that need to be answered. And I have a, an extensive multi-wavelength follow-up plan to help answer these questions. So in conclusion, um, today I presented iron 10 6374 as a new potential selection technique for um, black holes and dwarf galaxies. This is a really powerful tool because it can help us identify black hole activity in vigorously star forming low mass dwarf galaxies that are virtually impossible to find using traditional optical techniques. And furthermore, they're easily applicable to the readily available optical surveys. In addition to being a new and exciting detection technique, it can help us place important constraints on the black hole population in dwarf galaxies. So first, it can help us better constrain that lower limit on black hole masses. And secondly, it can help us identify both high and low accretion rate or high and low luminosity active black holes and dwarfs. And all of these are really important, not only for understanding the black hole population in dwarf galaxies, but for understanding the um, seeding mechanisms of supermassive black holes. Um, and with that, I'd like to say thank you for your time and I'll take any questions you might have. Thanks. Great. Let's uh, let's thank Mallory for that excellent talk. And uh, questions. We'll take questions now. Um, just open up the questions here. Uh, so I think um, was it Yakimov first? Yes. Thanks. Uh, thanks for the talk and congratulations. And so mine is just a comment. Uh, um, I wanted just to say that I think it's uh, important uh, to use uh, Iron 10 uh, to identify black holes in uh, dwarf galaxies as um, rather than relying only on the optical BPT uh, diagrams. Um, as this seems to be a more unambiguous uh, tracer of, uh, of the presence of black holes. 
while optical uh, diagnostics, so BPT diagrams, are more uh, susceptible to uncertainties. I mean, the, the curves are not, uh, um, are not uh, let's say, carved in stones, I would say. So uh, it doesn't mean that if a point is uh, beyond the curve or so slightly beyond the curve or slightly before, it's uh, star forming or AGN, right? Yeah. And so, yeah, for example, I'm thinking of a recent paper by David Lowe and collaborators where they used the manga um, special resolved data to, uh, let's say, re reanalyze and redefine, so rethink the, the, the different uh, regions in the BPT diagrams and classifications. Uh, so, we, which moved uh, the, the um, traditional uh, QLE curves that uh, we usually use and know. Um, and so, related to this, I uh, was uh, thinking uh, about your uh, one of your slides uh, where you were showing uh, uh, some points uh, which in the, di in the N2 and S2 BPT diagram were in the star forming uh, area, while in the O1 uh, they were in the AGN area. Um, and so, uh, in, in that uh, low paper I was referring to, the um, curve separating star forming and AGN, uh, where it moves most, it's in the O1. So it moves a lot towards the top right. And so in this case, uh, with these new definitions, uh, these points uh, would uh, be consistent among the three different diagrams uh, indeed. So uh, because, uh, yeah, either in the S2 and the, in the O1, the, the curve moves to the right a bit in the S2 and a lot in the O1. So yeah, uh, this was just, uh, yeah, um, uh, how do you say, yeah, an insight, yeah. Yeah. Thank you. I agree. The I've spent a lot of time thinking about BPT diagrams in my previous work. There's a lot of complex issues, not only in terms of where the models are, but how we can, um, how should we account for the effects of shocks and how that moves things along the BPT diagram. So there's, um, it's definitely not as clear cut as, as what I'm presenting here. Um, um, however, this really wasn't my main diagnostic. So I was mostly just using it to see using this traditional kind of QLE lines, what would happen? Um, but yeah, I agree. It's a very complex matter. Um, I think some cases it can be unambiguous, like the one that's AGN in all three. I think that's a pretty clear cut case. Yeah, sure. Um, well, but the other ones I wouldn't necessarily, um, I'm not labeling any of them as AGNs. I'm labeling them as like potential candidates using this diagnostic um, and nothing, nothing more intense than that yeah yeah now a quick thing quick thing that just came to my mind is that uh, low mass star forming galaxies especially lie in this borderline region so it's uh, it really applies to the dwarf galaxies so yeah it's, it's yeah it's really hard because of the metallicity um dependence like kind of mess uh foiled in with that so yeah it's a very it always seems very simple when you're a student, but then once you study it a little more, you realize this is not as simple as it looks. So those are really good points. Thanks. Yeah, good points. And also uh, for lower mass black holes, the SED is different. And uh, uh, Jenna Kahn's work showed that um, um, BPT diagnostics don't work when the black hole mass falls really in the threshold that's expected for these lower mass galaxies. So. Yeah, very good points. Michael, and then we'll okay. Anil and Abhijit. I just had a quick question about um, the modeling of the iron 10 line because he said it sometimes gets blended with the O1 line. So I was just wondering, how did you deal with those situations? Are you able to tell apart when they're, the two lines are blended together versus when the iron 10 line just isn't there or in those cases are you just not able to detect those lines so that's a really good question um that's so the reason that we did this three-step fitting process was to account for that potential blending issue um so we do not fit o3 freely o3 6300 um which i'm showing here in the top right 
was never blended with the 6313 line in the SDSS spectra that I was looking at. So I was able to get a pretty clean model of the 016300 line. And um, the 016300 and 6363 line are perfectly described by physics, right? So you can just basically shrink the flux by a factor of three and then scoot it over and it's the same, it should have the same line shape. So then I can just perfectly subtract out the 6363 line um, based on that 6300 line model. And so then I fit the residual spectra um, for the iron 10 line. So I do subtract all of the expected iron 10 or a 16363 mission before fitting that iron 10 line for that reason. Okay, I see. Thank yeah. you. Great question, Michael. And Anil? Yeah, thanks, Mallory. This was a really interesting talk uh, and really interesting work. Um, I had a question about the accretion rates, uh, and you you mentioned like low and high. There was this example of a high accretion rate system and an example of a low accretion rate system. And I guess I was wondering uh, kind of two things. One, what do you mean by that? Well, like, what is the Eddington ratios that you're referring to there, or whatever? Um, and then the second thing is, do you, have you thought about you know what are the luminosities in iron ten itself? Is there some sort of volumetric correction? that uh, rough, rough bolometric correction, which would allow you to estimate the total luminosities here? Yeah, so those are um, really good questions. I have not personally started looking at the um, Eddington ratios myself. Those were from previous work. Um, so I think, I can't remember the Eddington ratios off the top of my head, but I know that, um, that based on the X-ray emission, the uh, Markarian 709 South was expected to have a pretty low Eddington ratio. Um, and the opposite was true for um, 256802. Um, however, I haven't really started looking at it kind of broadly in the sample. This is more just like previous work showed that these two um, were a high and a low accretion rate um, style object. I do have plans to look in that more fully in the whole sample, I'm planning some follow-up observations that can look, uh, give us that more concretely um, as a sample itself. And I haven't applied any corrections because I'm not sure what's what. And so I think like once I get my follow-up data, which then I can get good or decent Eddington ratio measurements for these objects, then I can start thinking about um, where does the iron 10 come from in these objects? And are there kind of trends, like are the um, lower luminosities, do they have stronger or weaker iron 10 emission, et cetera? Um, so these are things that I plan on doing um, with follow-up work. Thanks a lot, yeah. Great, um, Abhijit and then Thomas. Thank you so much for the excellent talk. This is really interesting uh, analysis. Uh, I had one question about the uh, sources. So uh, I think from most of the sources that you have looked at from uh, your group, they have been quite nearby sources. So do you know whether this analysis will be applicable to uh, higher redshift sources and sort of like what redshift limit would be uh, where the iron line would be uh, useful for uh, detecting AGN emission? Um. So these were basically just anything in the NSA that uh, had iron 10 in its observed wavelength regime. I don't think there necessarily needs to be, um, I can't think of a good reason why you wouldn't be able to detect it at higher redshifts. You would just, you might need to change the instrument you're using, um, but, yeah, I can't think of any real reason. It is a weak line, so you would need to have pretty high quality data. Like um, I was thinking about head decks, but like that is a very, if I remember correctly, it's pretty low res, not, well, not low res, but like low um, observation time spectra. So I'm not sure if it would be able to pick up those lines in like dwarf galaxies, for example. Um, but I'm pretty sure I've heard of like, objects at distance that have coronal line emission that are um, 
potentially more massive than this. So there's no reason that it couldn't be available. You just have to consider the fact that it is weak and that if it is a small black hole, it's going to be weaker still, and you're going to be competing with the host galaxy starlight. Um, so it's more of a function of how strong is that line versus like, would it necessarily be detectable? Thank you so much. Great. So we have all these corona line experts with their hands up. So Thomas is detecting all these corona lines and outflows and dwarf galaxies. So Thomas, you can go next. And then Francisco uh, and Melissa after that. Yeah, thank you, uh, Natalie, for this. Uh, my question is in regards to the uh, other corona lines in the optical. Uh, some ones that come off the top of my head are the neon five, a little bluer, but uh, do you see any other chrono lines? Uh, I, I know there's a lot of iron ones, such as uh, 6087. Uh, have, you, have you looked at those? So yeah, um, neon uh, was kind of blue shifted out of the SDSS spectra for most of my objects. I did look for the other iron 10 or iron chrono lines. I think I found one object uh, 256802, actually, the high accretion rate black hole, had one other detectable iron 10 line, but the others were not detected. However, it's not really clear to me um, whether or not that's because uh, that's because they're not there or because the host galaxy is pretty bright in that region. Like this, the stellar continuum around 6300 is pretty flat. Um, and it's not necessarily as flat in the other regions, so it might be difficult to kind of tease it out um, in some way. So, yeah. 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 I mean, like, a lot of them have varying ionization potentials. So. Yeah. I was yeah. thinking of trying to use that to look at, like, the, ion the ionization, um, like, the, uh, the strength of the ionization field and, like, whatever, but... Yeah, I wasn't able to detect any, unfortunately. Um, I do have plan for optical IFU follow-up that might help with some of that um, for these objects. So yeah, that's definitely something I'm thinking about. Sure, thank you. Great, thanks, Thomas. And Francisco? Yes, hello, everyone. Um, Thomas just asked my question. <laughs> <laughs> so it, it's about the, the other corona lines um, in the optical. But also, I just would like to add, maybe you could also look at corona lines in the near infrared, specifically silicon six. Yeah. Yeah. That's a good point. Yeah. Yeah, that, that was all. Thanks. Yeah, that's our JWST program, so. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I have plans for that, too. I have plans for all the things, so. <laughs> <laughs> so, Melissa? Hi, Mallory. Thank you for the talk. Um, so I was just wondering if um, in your 81 iron 10 detections, if you noticed any outflow signatures? Um, no, but like, <laughs> again, um, this could be, I don't know if I have this slide. Hold on, just to do this. So um, in one of the objects that I looked at, um, with, this is from my other 2021 paper. Um, this is from the Rhines et al. Um, radio selected sample. I used GMOS IFU data and I did detect um, like O1 outflows. Um, so you can see there's a broad component of O1 and then I also saw extended O1 emission that was kind of centered on that radio source. Um, but none of this was detected in the SDSS spectrum. So it's really hard for me to know whether it's just a fact that like three arc seconds is pretty huge for a dwarf galaxy and maybe it's just hiding the outflow signatures or maybe there's just no outflow signatures. It's really hard to tell based on what I have. And so that's why I do have plans to do IFU follow-up to try to look for signatures of outflows and things. Okay, cool, thank you. Great question, Melissa. Um, Gabby and then Jeffrey. Yeah, great talk, Mallory. Um, I really enjoyed it. So uh, along the same theme of uh, outflows and corona lines. Um, so, you know, Thomas, who asked the question earlier, he's he's found corona lines in dark galaxies, near infrared corona lines, like uh, Francisco was saying. And uh, and he finds them to be very closely associated with outflows. And, and he's just about to finish another paper where he finds the same in bulchless galaxies. 
So, but I wanted to ask you, since, since you have such strong star bursting galaxies, um, I wanted to ask you a little more about the model of uh, uh, mechanically driven coronal lines. How, how does that model work so that you can exclude the possibility that it's uh, driven by, by stellar winds? So um, the model that I'm using is, it's, it's an older model. It's Wilson Raymond 1999. And they showed that um, Seifert, like, um, like outflows from Seifert, uh, Seifert uh, like engines can create coronal line emission. Um, I then kind of looked through um, <clears throat> various starburst driven winds um, because I was worried about that too. Um, and looking in the literature, it seemed that the majority of the iron 10 emission was created through supernovae in these models, not necessarily through the winds themselves. Um, so I, I, I can't remember which papers I looked through, but I think it was like, I looked through three or four different papers and that seemed to be the consensus. So then I looked at the models and it was um, through supernovae. And so that's when I decided to use um, the type two and supernova as like my maximum cutoff to create that line in particular. I think it can create coronal lines in general, um, but not iron 10 in particular, so. All right, so, so it's, mostly based on the energetics uh, you would need yeah it's supernovae. yeah it's a pretty energetic line so um i think that that's what's causing it yeah all right thank you hey um jeffrey hello thank you for the talk um i'm going to ask about the x-rays because that's where i have the most experience um in those six objects that you found archival observations with chandra do you have what like the x-ray spectrum actually looks like of those objects like is it more thermal emission or is it like power law emission um, um yeah i don't remember the specifics but i did plot like a hardness i plotted the hardness uh ratios in my paper um i just can't remember it off okay but yeah it's in there it's in my paper if you want to look okay at cool for more details yeah thank you Great, thanks, Jeffrey. And I have one burning question. Uh, can I ask it quickly? Because <laughs> it's it's already one. But um, yeah, also, I, I'm just curious because 81 out of 46,000, that's a very small fraction. And uh, it's sort of uh, piggybacking on Anil's question, which is, is that just a detectability issue? Um, because you know, you, you have the um, stellar masses, right? And so you can make some estimate of the black hole mass and yeah. some estimate of the expected volumetric luminosity giving some Eddington ratio and then some volumetric correction factor to estimate the iron 10. And I just wondered whether, you know, how much are we limited by some sensitivity and how much are just not showing the corona line? I think um, for SDSS, it's definitely sensitivity limited um, because the, um, let's see the, this one, um, J12, 20, 30, 20 iron 10 was not, um, detected in the SDSS spectrum, but it was detected in the Gemini eye if you follow up. So I do think that some of this for sure is definitely due to three arc seconds is just very large for trying to find somewhat weak coronal line emission in dwarf galaxies. Um, and so it might be easier with, for example, JWST to look for um, coronal lines with higher res, more sensitive NAR data. But um, yeah, I don't know. I don't know how to like define if I think like how to estimate for that and then say, this is how many iron 10 selected galaxies we should expect. Um, we went in, I went in basically not being sure if I, I would find it. Um, I started with the like weak detect or the detection you see here in my 709 South. And I was like, hey, that was an SDSS. Maybe we can find some other things. So I was happy to find 81. I know it sounds like a low number, um, but considering that 50% of my two case studies did not show iron 10, uh, iron 10 emission in the SDSS spectrum, I was like not very confident that I would necessarily come up with a very large sample just because it is um, a weak line and three arc seconds is large relatively. So 
Yeah, that's frustrating. Um, but yeah. the key is to go in the infrared because <laughs> the yeah. chronic are much stronger. Yeah. And much higher sensitivity with JWST. Yeah, that's true. Um, however, I do think that it's still worth doing because it can help you identify objects that might be interesting to look at in the oh, infrared. Oh, absolutely. I'm so, so um, it's one of those things where, yeah, you're kind of getting somewhat diminishing returns because of the lower, um, not lower signal to noise, but like the impact of the host galaxy on this very weak line. But um, you can still find some, which I think is exciting. So. Yeah, yeah, I think it's very exciting and, and excellent talk and very nice work. So let's give Mallory a final round of applause for an excellent talk. And, uh, and thanks for joining everyone. And I think Jeffrey has a Discord link in the chat for uh, discussion after the talk. Yep, if uh, any students want to join, or Mallory, you're welcome to, if you want to come by. Yeah, um, sure. I'll be there. Yeah, <laughs> see you there if you can. <laughs> Thanks, guys.